Hello and welcome to this Australian BioCommons webinar on high performance bioinformatics, submitting your best NCMAS application. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian BioCommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for today's webinar. In these webinars, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and technologies available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear about a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help Australian researchers to achieve their best agricultural, medical and environmental research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons via the links that you can see on your screen. Before we begin the webinar today, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today's webinar focuses on the National Merit Allocation Scheme or NCMAS for access to high performance computing and it has been jointly organised with the Sydney Informatics Hub at the University of Sydney. We're joined today by Dr. Georgina Samaha and Dr. Tracy Chu from the Sydney Informatics Hub, who will talk, who will walk us through the NCMAS scheme, share their experience of supporting researchers to submit NCMAS applications, and show us what a typical bioinformatics application looks like. We'll wrap up the webinar with a short Q&A session as well. Welcome to the webinar, Tracy and Georgina, and I'll now hand over to you to get us started. Okay, so hopefully you can see that short URL and the QR code. Um, I thought we'd start off by doing something fun. Um, we're going to do a live poll. So if everyone could join the poll by going to the link um, or using the QR code on, on the screen. Um, Georgie, if you could paste the link into the chat, I think that'd be really helpful for people. You can access the poll from the web browser or your mobile phone. Um, the question will be very general and your responses will be anonymous, um, but we will all be able to see the proportion of responses. So I think it's a nice fun way for us to get to know each other. So I'll give you a couple of seconds just to join. Um, and if you could give me a thumbs up or let me know if, you've, if you're in. All right, so the first question is, which of these best describes you? Um, I'm here to see if I should apply. I am a first time NCMAS applicant. My past application was unsuccessful or I was awarded only part of my allocation. Okay, great. So it looks like there are mostly, or half of us are first time applicants. Quarter of us are, oh, sorry. 30% of us are first time applicants. About half, just under half of you are seeing if you should apply. And a couple have applied for NCMAS in the past. So cool. Thanks for doing that, guys. Um, so we'll have another poll question later um, in the presentation. So if you could keep this open, um, that'd be really good. I'll just share my slides now. So as Melissa mentioned, my name is Tracy and I'm from the Sydney Informatics Hub, which is a core research facility at the University of Sydney. And since 2018, we've supported several research groups who have achieved successful NCMAS allocations. And so today we hope to help you with your applications. Today, uh, we are currently working in partnership with the Australian Biocommons and their partner institutions, which include both research organisations and compute facility providers um, to help life science researchers by boosting their capacity to do excellent research. And one of the ways that we are doing this is through the Bring Your Own Data Expansion Project, and that is centred all around enabling highly accessible, available and scalable analysis. And um, Georgie and I in particular are specifically involved with doing this for command line interface platforms. So this webinar is a part of our activities with the command line interface 
Bring Your Own Data project. And it aims to help applicants with accessing national compute facilities available through NCMAS. As bioinformatics is an emerging computational discipline, uh, we hope to help you today by giving you some tips to help you understand if NCMAS is right for you. We'll um, focus on how to address the technical aspects of your application, um, introduce some key technical concepts to you, describe strategies used to achieve computationally performant bioinformatics workflows, and also just um, to help you generally understand the landscape of high performance computing used across domains in Australia, how bioinformatics fits in with this and how you can use this to put your best application forward. So I have to say, preparing an NCMAS application is quite an involved process. And today we're just touching on the key technical aspects of the application. Uh, NCMAS only opened a couple of days ago. Actually, I think it officially opened yesterday. Um, so a lot of what we are sharing today is based off um, past NCMAS rounds, but from my knowledge, this year is pretty similar to the last. Um, but please do refer to the official NCMAS 2022 documentation for specific eligibility and uh, assessment criteria. So today we'll first go through whether NCMAS is right for you and your research project. We'll talk about preparing data to support your application and then about preparing the actual application. And then um, Georgie will be taking you through a few slides containing words of advice from the allocation committee that were provided by uh, Roger Edberg, the user services manager from uh, the National Compute Infrastructure, who I believe is also on the call. And uh, we're really thankful to be able to share that with you today. Lastly, we'll point you to some additional resources um, and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. All right, so NCMAS is a prestigious meritorious allocation scheme, and it is a pathway to access federally funded compute facilities. In 2022, it includes three high performance computing facilities, um, including NCI Gardi, Pawsey Satonics, and Massive. There are generally three assessment phases in NCMAS, the first being an administrative phase, so just checking general things like your eligibility, uh, the compliance of your application, and if it's complete. The second is the technical assessment, and finally is the merit assessment, and I believe this year it's more or less the same. So my very first recommendation to you is to check your el eligibility and to evaluate if your research meets uh, the merit criteria before you even begin with your technical assessment. Once you're comfortable that you're eligible, you can then assess whether the compute facilities available are suitable for you and your research. To do this, um, I find it very useful to have a plan for what you would like to use these facilities for in 2022, as you'll need to calculate how much compute resources you will consume or how much you, you wanna apply for. These compute resources are allocated quarterly, so it is also helpful to have this plan broken down into quarters. And if you do have a plan, um, do keep this in mind throughout the webinar. Next, I'd recommend taking the time to understand the specific hardware and usage policies of each facility and do a bit of matchmaking to see if uh, these suit the workflows that you wanna run. You can get a general idea from the facility overview section provided in the NCMAS information for applicants document, which I believe is available now. Um, but NCMAS does require or does have an expectation for you to have a strong high performance computing background. And so from your experience, you should have an understanding of how your tools perform, what resources they need, how much time they require, uh, and so on. If the resources you have access to uh, were inadequate, and hence why you're applying for NCMAS, knowing why they were inade inadequate is also really helpful. So 
Massive typically supports very specific areas of research, and so most bioinformaticians would apply for an allocation on NCI Gardi or PAUSI. And typically, the bioinformatics workflows that suit Gardi or Cytonics are ones that are highly resource efficient, um, scalable, and have multi node capability or require some kind of specialized hardware. And as most bioinformatics pipelines don't actually run this way natively, um, they do typically require some level of optimization or re engineering. So I can say that from our experience, NCMAS tends to be for quite data intensive, large scale bioinformatics, just to meet the minimum compute request criteria. So to give you an idea of scale, a typical mapping and variant calling project would need to include hundreds of large genomes. So something like the human genome. Um, other suitable workflows tend to be those that require specialized hardware, such as memory or disk local to the node, which are quite common for IO intensive algorithms that are characteristic to a lot of de novo assemblers. Use of other specialized hardware, such as GPUs, is also great too. And there are a lot of bioinformatics tools um, emerging that are GPU enabled. So once you have an idea of the compute resources you need, uh, you should consider if there are more suitable options. So that could be going to a completely different compute facility available to you, or it could be by accessing PAUSI, NCI, or Massive through alternate schemes or channels that are more suitable to you. For instance, um, at NCI, there are about 29 collaborating organizations. I know USID is one of them, and we hold local allocation schemes. PAUSI also has similar partnerships and uh, local allocation schemes. So, so far what I've talked about requires you to have knowledge and experience with running your pipelines and knowing the compute resources required for them to run. If you don't have experience or know how to do this, um, don't worry, there is opportunity for you to get some or to seek help. So things you could do is uh, are to run your pipelines on a facility that are available to you, to attend training. Um, the N, uh, there are a few online sessions about NCMAS 2022, but also NCI and PAUSI have a, like a catalog of training that they run regularly. NCI, PAUSI, and Massive also have a help desk that you can contact. Um, I also recommend doing some reading, becoming really familiar with common compute terminology and concepts. And one of the papers I recommend is called 10 Simple Rules for Getting Started with Command Line Bioinformatics. And the last thing that I'll mention is getting a startup project, which I'll talk more about later. Okay, cool. So now, oops, we're going to do our second poll question. Um, I'll skip to the next question. The next question is, is NC Maths right for you? Yes, I am ready to apply. Maybe I need to check my eligibility. Maybe if my workflows are suitable, Maybe if I meet the minimum uh, compute request or no. Okay, really interesting responses. I'm glad none of you have clicked no yet, although don't worry if you don't feel you're not eligible. Um, I won't be offended if you leave the <laughs> webinar now. Um, it is it is a full on process, so it is good to be sure that this is the right thing for you. All right, so now we'll talk about gathering data to support your application. So why do you need to collect data? Well, as I mentioned, NCMAS is a highly competitive scheme. And in your application, you will need to demonstrate experience running the tools on the facility that you're applying for. You'll need to give evidence that the tools use the compute resources efficiently uh, and when applied at scale. 
Um, you'll need to show the optimal compute job configurations to apply, the data storage requirements, data movement and life cycle. You'll need to show that you have an understanding of the algorithms and workflows applied and justify why you need these resources. So how do you get, how do you go about gathering data? Um, if you are new to NCMAS, the best way is through a startup project. So startup projects give you a very small allocation to the system and can be used to assess if the facility is fit for your purpose, to gain experience on the system, and to obtain performance and compute resource metrics to address the technical parts of your application. Because startup allocations are quite small, and I'm um, having gone through this several times myself, I recommend following these steps when you go about gathering data. So first is to install the tools and set up your pipeline. Uh, second is to choose a very small representative data set. Third is to benchmark each job in your pipeline. Fourth is to uh, perform scalability tests using the most resource efficient configuration that you've identified in step three. And then fifth is to extrapolate the required uh, resources um, needed to process the full data set. So let's go through each of these steps using an example scenario. Let's pretend that you would like to apply for NCMAS and use this allocation to align 1,000 whole human genomes sequenced with an Illumina platform at 100 times coverage. The pipeline that you want to use follows Broad's best practices pipeline, which does include a series of tools and steps. Um, but for now, let's just look at the aligned job um, as an example, which does happen to be the largest job in this pipeline. Um, this is the command that I want to use. And it includes the tools BWA, MEM, and um, SAM tools. So first step is pretty self-explanatory. It's to install the tools in this case, is, which is BWA and SAM tools. Second um, is to choose a small representative data set. So let's say you've already done whole genome sequencing in the past and you have six samples that are available from a previous study that are of the same species, so human, um, were sequenced with the same platform, chemistry, to the same coverage, et cetera, to what you plan to sequence your 1,000 genomes with. You can further the subsample these and take just, the, uh, just 500,000 read pairs from one sample for benchmarking. And then you can use your six samples uh, for scalability testing. So step three is to perform benchmarking. Benchmarking is the process of measuring compute utilization efficiency given a set of resources to perform a task. So in this example, we know that VWN samples have multi-threading, but not multi-node capability. We can benchmark and observe how well VWA and samples can use two, four, six, and 12 CPUs. And um, this is actually a real example that we conducted on NCI Guardi. And the reason why we picked these numbers are that they are factors of 48, because we know that the normal nodes on Guardi have a two by 24 CPU configuration with 12 CPUs per NUMA node. So here are the results that we achieved. Um, if we look at wall time first, you can see that it took about four minutes with two CPUs to align those 500,000 pairs of reads. And if we use four CPUs, this time just about halves. And as we keep increasing the number of CPUs, the wall time um, keeps on decreasing. This might seem good, but if we have a look at the CPU efficiency, the most CPU efficient configuration is using two CPUs and the efficiency does decline as we add more CPUs. As a general rule of thumb, anything under about 0.7 to 0.75 is starting to look kind of CPU inefficient. 
if we have a look at um, the memory efficiency, we can see that the job doesn't actually require much memory and it's more so a CPU dependent job. On Guardi's normal notes, there is about four gigs of mem um, available per core anyway. So I'm quite comfortable at leaving it at this rate. The last thing that you should look at is the service units. So service units um, is the currency of compute resources. And it's the unit that you'll be using when you're requesting the amount of resources that you need in your NCMAS application. So you can calculate service units um, by multiplying the number of CPUs by the wall time hours and sometimes um, by scaling factors. So I know that on NCI Guardi, the normal nodes have a scaling factor of two, whereas the huge mem nodes have approximately a scaling factor of three. So with this benchmarking data, you can then choose to uh, choose what you think is the most optimal usage of resources. I've gone with the four CPUs because not, it's not the most CPU efficient, but it's pr pretty good at 0 0.91, and I save almost half the wall time. Um, and in addition, you can see that it costs the least in terms of service units. So now that you've done your benchmarking and know the optimal job resources to use to align 500,000 pairs of reads, we need to test that this still holds true if we increase the scale of the job. So this is where our six samples will come into play. So as I've mentioned before, um, most bioinformatics tools don't actually natively scale well, but we can improve this with some re-engineering. And today I'll describe one approach to do this with you. And um, that's the scatter gather approach. You probably do some level of this already. So for example, if you did have your six um, samples to align, you'd probably do this in parallel rather than serially. Um, but you can do this to an even greater extent by splitting your fast queue pairs even further, performing alignment and then gathering them back into alignments per sample. So in our example, uh, we can align all six samples, including 4.8 billion pairs of reads by splitting these into chunks of 500,000 pairs of reads to align in parallel, allocating four CPUs for each chunk to align and performing multiple align tasks in parallel and distributing these tasks across multiple nodes. I really hope that made sense. <laughs> um, if the job is scalable, we would expect wall time to drop as we add more resources to perform these tasks. So here we're testing the scalability of this job using 30 nodes, uh, 60, 90, and 120. Um, remembering that on Guardi, each of the nodes have 48 CPUs. And looking at this graph, um, which contains our results, if we look at the wall time in blue, we do see this pattern that the wall time is dropping as we increase the number of CPUs used. And looking at the service units in red, remembering that this is the currency calculated by the compute resources consumed, we do see that it's roughly maintained regardless of the number of CPUs allocated. Both of these indi indicate strong scaling. And if we look further into the CPU efficiency, uh, which is um, in these white boxes here, we can see that a relatively high efficiency is maintained. So now that we've benchmarked, uh, determined the com optimal compute resources to use and demonstrated scalability, we can use this information to extrapolate the resources we needed, uh, we need to align, uh, to process the full data set. So in this case, it is to align the 1000 genomes. We can also plan the optimal job configuration um, according to the facility usage par paradigm, such as the resource request limits. So I'm going to use compute resource metrics when performing scalability testing, um, because it's much more straightforward to go from six samples to a thousand samples. 
Here, we're still using four CPUs per line task, and I've allocated um, 2,880 CPUs or 60 nodes to align six samples. So if we allocate roughly 10 nodes per sample to perform a line, we should expect similar CPU and RAM efficiency. We know that it took 2,085 service units to um, align these six samples. So that's equivalent to 348 service units per sample. So looking at NCI Guardi's Q limits, I know that there is a limit of requesting just under 21,000 CPUs uh, for five hours. So with this, I would suggest running two align jobs, processing 500 samples per job, and that should keep me within the resource request limits per job. So using our rate of 348 service units per sample, I have also calculated the QLA service units required to align the full thousand. Um, and notice here, I've also included a buffer to account for sample variation. We found that asking for reasonable buffers is quite acceptable, provided you explain why you need this. So just quickly, you would also do the same for storage, reporting the inputs, outputs, processing disk required, inodes, and if applicable, any disk local to the node or other specialized disk required. Here's what I found for, uh, I needed for six samples. And this is extrapolated for the thousand samples. So this was actually based off real data um, you might actually be familiar with this data set. It's from the Platinum Genomes data set, which is sequenced to about 92 times coverage. And from here, you can see that I'd need to request about 317 terabytes of space to process all of these genomes. So as you can see, this particular workflow in, involves big data and a decent amount of compute resources. It is um, therefore really important to present in detail your inputs, outputs, disk, inodes, um, the data lifecycle, and also your long-term data storage plan. Okay, cool. So now that we've um, talked about how to prepare the data, uh, prepare your data for your application, we'll actually talk about the application itself now. So applications are submitted through an online portal and there will be a number of fields that require type in responses or, and or uploading your responses in PDF format. There are slight differences in the application form for new applicants versus established projects. Um, the process is quite, is well laid out in the information for applicants 2022 document, so you can find it there. Generally speaking, the responses required are centered towards you and your research. So whether you're an early career researcher or if you um, fall into one of the special consideration cat, uh, categories, it'll also ask you about your field of research. Um, it'll ask you for a research proposal and basically things about your track record. So things like your funding, um, the publications you have, conference papers and presentations relevant to your project. Of course, there will also be responses required for the technical aspects of your project, including the compute request in KSUs, so Kilo Service Units, um, nominated at each nominated facility. Um, it'll ask you for your prior HPC experience, uh, the software that you want to use, computational details, a clear justification of um, supercomputer resources. And it'll also ask you about um, usage of any previous allocations if you are successful for NCMAS in the past. So the information for applicants document also breaks down the computational details required. Hopefully these all look familiar to you from when we spoke about gathering data to support your application. So it'll ask you to provide things like scalability, compute job resources, storage, algorithms, and workflows, 
and again, a clear justification of why you need these supercomputer resources. Perhaps one thing that we didn't really speak about is the last point. Um, if you have found that one of your jobs are inefficient, there is opportunity to discuss why and to present strategies that you've tried and to describe what you have found has worked best. Cool, so I'll now pass it over to Georgie. Um, Georgie will be going through the recommendations kindly provided by the allocation committee. And these are specifically geared towards bioinformatics. Um, and again, we also have online Roger, the user services manager from NCI, who also looks after NCMAS. And we have Javed, um, who is a bioinformatician from NCI, if you have any questions for them. So I'll hand it over to you, Georgie. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so there are a few elements um, that are essential for you to include in your application if you're going to really do it justice. Many of these points um, echo Tracy's advice from earlier. Uh, firstly, it's important to remember that the members of the allocation committee come from a diverse um, range of backgrounds and disciplines. Um, many of them won't be familiar with the ins and outs of bioinformatics workflows um, or the biological concepts behind the work that you do. So it's really important that you explain things very clearly um, and you avoid using too much jargon and assumed knowledge. Um, also make sure you give a very clear description of the biological problems that require um, substantial compute resources. Um, they also suggest you make sure you present your anal analytical pipelines very clearly. So that means describe each step in detail, define your work work workflows overall structure, its inputs and outputs um, for each step, along with the compute and storage requirements. Um, and you can also demonstrate to the committee that your application has been thoughtfully designed for the HPC environment. Uh, if you've worked with a bioinformatician who's experienced in HPCs um, in putting your application together and designing your pipelines. So go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of the computational details that you should address, um, remember that traditional HPC workflows are very different from the kind of pipelines and workflows that we use in bioinformatics. So this means that you're gonna to need to highlight um, how you've designed your workflows to make the best use of the resources that are available at the facility. Uh, you should also be very clear um, about listing the software applications that you've used. Um, these applications um, implement very complex algorithms so they're often, and they're also often not designed for HPCs that you're going to be running them on. Um, so they're each going to have some limitations that might affect their efficiency and the overall efficiency of your workflow. So you can address some of these limitations um, through the way you implement the tools, um, as Tracy mentioned earlier. Um, for workflows, for example, that have input and output bottlenecks um, and limited scalability, you could clarify how you've designed your pipeline to account for these as best you can. Um, so for processes that create, for example, a lot of tiny temporary intermediate files like a de novo assembly, uh, you can avoid stressing the file system by using um, some of the specialized disk like disk local to the node to store these files um, rather than the scratch disk. And you should explain these sorts of things in your application. I remember also that in working with large biological data sets, our workflows have very high storage requirements. Um, you should clearly explain what storage you, you're going to need um, for each stage and how you've used any temporary or long-term storage depending on the needs of each stage of your analysis. Uh, larger resources, larger, sorry, larger requests, allocation requests are going to receive more rigorous assessments. So if you're a first-time applicant, um, you should avoid um, very large requests of say greater than a million service units unless you have a very, very strong case as to why you would need these resources and you're gonna really need to be able to justify that. Uh, it's also reasonable, as Tracy mentioned earlier, to request additional resources um, as a buffer, so long as you can explain why. Um, and so requests for an additional 10% or so usually cover you for contingencies and can account for things like biological variation between the samples that might have um, differences like uh, sequencing depth. Here's the next trade, uh, slide, thanks Tracy. Uh, so there are a few additional things you can do to make your bioinformatics applications more competitive um, by demonstrating that you clearly understand the compute resources that you're going to be working with and you're making efficient use of the facility. So these things include presenting very basic scaling performance um, of the software applications that do support multi-threading, as Tracy showed you earlier in the mapping example. 
Uh, this shows you've carefully thought through the optimal use of your applications. You can also show memory usage for memory intensive tasks to support your resource requests. And you should also demonstrate um, the more specific examples of how you've addressed any performance bottlenecks of your pipelines. So in the case of long running jobs, like a genome alignment task, you could highlight how splitting your sequence into small intervals, um, like at the chromosome level, and aligning these small intervals in parallel will reduce your runtime and overall resource demands. Um, and finally, uh, workflow management tools like Nextflow and Snakemake are becoming very popular in bioinformatics. Um, they can be really useful ways for us to um, develop and deploy scalable and reproducible workflows. They can also be used to parallelize your workloads at scale on HPCs. Um, so they're very useful management tools. And next slide, thanks, Tracy. Uh, so just to wrap up the committee's recommendations, um, bioinformatics is, a relative, is relatively new to the NCMAS process um, and the organizers, as well as the different compute infrastructures, um, are learning how better to support um, us and our needs. Um, but bioinformatics uh, NCMAS applicants are still in the minority, even though this has been growing over the last few years. Uh, just remember that um, bioinformatics is quite different to other disciplines that use HPC systems at scale. So you're gonna need to highlight to the reviewers that you understand the compute infrastructure you're working with and you've defined, you've designed your workflows um, with that in the forefront of your mind. Thanks, Tracy. Cool. Thank you, Georgie, and um, to the committee again for sharing those tips. So before we head over to Q&A, um, I'd like to share some useful resources with you. So the slides do contain live links and they will be shared with you later so you'll be able to access these. So first there are a couple of tools built um, through the Australian Biocommons BYOD project. The first one that I want to share with you is a tool called Toolfinder. This lets you search for tools already available on national compute facilities um, but also other popular compute facilities like Galaxy. It points you, it also points you to where you can um, access containerized versions of the tool. The next thing I want to share with you is Workflow Hub. This is a registry of workflows. And if you go to the Australian Biocommons page, there are a suite of pipelines submitted by the Biocommons and their partner institutions. And this does include already re-engineered pipelines that are suitable for Guardian Pawsey. Um, so you don't have to go through that process of optimizing your pipelines. So this includes things like, I think we've got mapping, germline variant calling, somatic variant calling, and those follow the Broad Best Practices pipelines. We also have a metagenomics pipeline with micropipe um, and a few assembly pipelines, including Trinity, um, Falcon and Canoe. The registry um, also includes pipelines um, that are deployable at other compute facilities, so not just the national compute facilities, uh, and we hope to add more in the near future. Here I've included some links to useful resources to you um, provided by the facilities themselves. And um, we are also preparing to share with you a sample application that was a successful one in, uh, from NCMAS 2021. So where to get further help? Um, if you would like warm body support, the best point of contact is your local ICT or compute facility support staff. There is an NCMAS email for questions about NCMAS or you can fill in um, the Australian Biocommons contact form for questions about the Biocommons projects. Um, and if you're here from the University of Sydney or have any questions about this presentation, you're welcome to email um, our Sydney Informatics Hub email. Okay, well, I think then we will wrap it up there for today. Thank you again to Tracy, Georgina, and to Roger for the advice from the committee. And um, thank you to all of us for joining us. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our funding. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by ANCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.